Hello, um, dear participants, welcome uh, to another week at the CILE Academy. Um, we are dealing with human rights this week and uh, uh, we are very sorry for this short delay, but we had a, um, a slight reschedule of our uh, lectures uh, because we have today with us um, Judge Hilary Charlesworth, who is joining us from The Hague. Um, and um, we will do uh, the lecture that was supposed uh, to happen today um, on uh, background on human rights um, tomorrow with Professor Maria Gavonelli and, um, and then on Thursday. So we'll do a, a slight uh, reschedule due to the availability of Judge Charlesworth, who we are delighted to have with us. And uh, on behalf of uh, Nilofer and myself, we warmly welcome Judge Hilary Charlesworth and uh, uh, we are um, so honored, um, as one of the participants is saying in the chat, so honored to have you with us. Um, you have been a judge in the ICJ uh, for the last couple of years and have been just re-elected. Uh, and we're delighted uh, that you've been re-elected to the ICJ, uh, where the court um, is busier, busier than ever. And so instead of losing time and, and giving the participants um, your background and your CV, which I'm sure they're familiar with, um, let me just uh, um, pass on the floor to you uh, so that we can have uh, um, the benefit of your lecture, which will be, as far as I understand, on human rights at the ICJ. Um, and, and, and just uh, again, uh, on behalf of the participants and, uh, uh, and, and Nilifer and myself, it's always a highlight uh, when we have uh, um, ICJ judges with you. But in particular, uh, Hilary, it's such a, such a pleasure to have you today with us. So um, the floor is all yours and I understand that you have a PowerPoint to share. So we'll guide you through that if needed. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Patricia, for that very warm welcome, and thank you to Nalufa also uh, for the uh, very, very kind introduction. And my apologies to the participants for um, my uh, schedule imposing the fact the lecture is coming today ahead of your chance to be introduced to the general uh, topic of international law. So uh, the uh, I. I do, I apologize very much for that, for that mix up. I am uh, going to, uh, now I have to engage in this wonderful technology. I'm going to share my screen um, and hope that it works. Uh, and uh, yes, go so back, great. Okay, let me yeah. just start with the first. PowerPoint. So what I what I thought today, what I could most usefully add to a general introduction to human rights was uh, considering the role of the International Court of Justice and the way that it's encountered with the field of human rights. So uh, I'm coming, if you like, with a fairly, some might say, recherche topic uh, in a general course, but uh, I thought that's what I'm perhaps most qualified to speak on. So the court, as I'm sure you're aware, is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, and it has a general jurisdiction, so it deals with any field of international law, and of course it can draw on any of the standard sources, the formal sources of international law, treaties, custom, and general principles. So if anybody uh, keeps an eye on the court's work, you just have to look at our website, you'll be aware that we are at the busiest point that the court has ever been. There are 18 contentious cases on our calendar. And as of uh, two weeks ago, we've got three requests for advisory opinions. It's a most unusual situation. But for our purposes, what's interesting is that quite a proportion of those cases and requests involve human rights issues. For example, the application of the uh, Convention on Genocide, uh, or the Convention on Racial Discrimination, and also we have had a recent case on the Convention Against Torture. And also our three advisory opinion requests, one relating to the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of the occupied Palestinian territory, one on the legal consequences of climate change, and the third, the most recent one, which is effectively on 
uh, the right to strike, whether there's right to strike under an ILO convention, these all raise uh, different human rights questions. So we've got a lot of human rights questions on our plate and yet the court, and you can see uh, a recent picture of the court here, this was uh, oral argument in a case brought by Ukraine against Russia relating to the 2014 uh, military activities in Crimea. So you can, uh, I'm using that, uh, you can see our current president there, Judge Joan Donoghue in the middle presiding over, over the court. Um, but the court you might think is quite a curious forum for these type of questions to be raised because of course, we are an interstate court and the individuals whose rights and needs are at the heart of human rights cases never are parties to our proceedings. Uh, and also uh, another limitation of our court, the International Court of Justice, is that its contentious jurisdiction relies on the consent of parties. In other words, states uh, who are before the court must have recognised that any human rights grievances that might be made against them uh, could be settled uh, by an impartial arbiter based exclusively on the law. So uh, this contrasts with the way that human rights is treated in many national legal systems, because in our domestic legal systems, human rights tend to be understood as a matter of public concern. So depending on the country, uh, in my own country, Australia, uh, human rights tend to be dealt with as a matter of constitutional, administrative or criminal law. So it's fair to say, I should say to start off, that uh, there are mixed reviews of the court's contribution to the field of human rights. And there are a number of scholars who have expressed quite a lot of disappointment in the court's failure to come to grips with uh, international human rights law. So one scholar has lamented, and I'm quoting from Malcolm Langford here, he's lamented the court's reputation for conservatism and formalism, and he's also referred to the stultified nature of the court's human rights jurisprudence. So there's a group of scholars taking this very dim view of what the court gets up to, and yet there are some who have celebrated what they see really as the court's increasingly sophisticated human rights jurisprudence. <clears throat> and so there are a number of people, and I'm thinking here, here particularly perhaps of some of the writings of a former judge of the court, a German judge, Bruno Zimmer, who's written a series of interesting articles over a few years saying, look, uh, the court has really come of age and it is capable of dealing with human rights issues in quite a sophisticated way. So, uh, what I want to do is to tell you, and I'm going to, of course, uh, it's a very partial story. I want to take you on a short journey through the court's jurisprudence, starting in 1951 and coming up to the present day. And uh, my, my lecture could be criticised for its highly selective use of cases, but I just thought these cases that I'll tell you about are quite a useful way of describing the court's uh, journey. Uh, what the argument I want to make is that the court overall has um, been very restrained in the way it develops the substance of human rights principles. But we can see that it's, uh, I think it has expanded. It has really done very interesting work in the context of what I'm going to call human rights procedural law. Uh, in other words, the type of rules uh, that govern when human rights norms apply and to who they apply in the context of interstate litigation. And importantly, who can invoke responsibility if there's an alleged human rights violation? So that's what I'll deal with. So not a great deal uh, of development on substance, although there are some exceptions to that, but this very interesting development in terms of procedural law or what the very famous uh, British philosopher H.L.A. Hart called uh, the secondary rules of international law, uh, the rules about rules. So uh, let me start the journey. And I have here an image uh, of Raphael Lemkin. Raphael Lemkin uh, seems to be a good image to accompany any reference to the Genocide Convention, because he is the jurist who's... Uh, uh, famed for having developed even the term genocide. He very much coined that word genocide. And uh, he was really the 
great source of energy and inspiration behind the adoption of the Genocide Convention, which of course is just about to turn 75. It was adopted on the 9th of December, uh, 1948. So um, we're about to reach, probably during your course, we're about to reach that, that very important um, milestone. So the Genocide Convention is interesting because it was the first UN treaty to directly address human rights. And um, I'm dealing with it because the Genocide Convention is at the heart of a number of major cases before the court. And indeed, uh, the court is currently uh, in the process of considering uh, cases that, uh, two major cases that involve this treaty that I'll refer to. So <clears throat> here's Raphael Lemkin. And then I also found on the wonderful UN website, uh, this uh, lovely photograph of um, four states, the representatives of uh, uh, Korea, Haiti, um, uh, France and Costa Rica are sitting across the front there. And you can perhaps see right at the, um, well, it's my right-hand side. I'm not sure which, you can see um, uh, there um, in the back row standing up, that's Raphael Lemkin again. And perhaps you can see the man leaning over there a bit in the back row, that's Trigvi Lee, the first uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. So uh, here is another, uh, interesting photograph. Uh, this is um, four states that were signing uh, at the moment of signing the Treaty 2, but these are very relevant to my story. So from left to right, it's uh, Belarusia, uh, the USSR ambassador, um, and uh, the Ukrainian, sorry, the, the man closest to the seated man is a UN official. And then the man on the right is the Ukrainian Deputy Foreign Minister. Given that we currently have a case before the court involving the genocide convention between Ukraine and Russia, I find this a particularly poignant photo. But let me come back uh, to the court. So the reason why uh, in 1951, uh, a case, uh, an important advisory opinion was delivered by the court was because the question of uh, making reservations to the Genocide Convention emerged uh, very early. So when a number of the states, and the states you can actually see at the moment who are signing the treaty are among these, a number of them attempted to make reservations to the treaty. And uh, there was a question then that was assigned to the court for an advisory opinion on the status of these reservations. So here is the text of the treaty uh, that was at issue in a number of the attempts to make reservations. So I should say, first of all, the Genocide Convention, if you look at it, you'll see that it doesn't expressly contemplate reservations. Um, and there was a big debate at the time the Genocide Convention was being signed. A number of states, including Australia, I should say, um, said, look, if states start making reservations to the Genocide Convention, this is really undermining the integrity of the convention. And they strongly objected to the practice. And they said states that make reservations to the treaty, we're not going to regard them as co-parties. So... Um, the General Assembly was trying to get round uh, that impasse and it said to the court, look, kindly give us an advisory opinion on whether a state can make reservations to the convention and whether a state that's made reservations can be considered a party to the convention, even if other states are objecting to the reservation. So uh, it's interesting when you look at the court's opinion uh, the court tried delicately to steer a middle course between the positions of, on the one hand, uh, the Australian and other uh, view that we need absolute treaty integrity, on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, those who said, look, this is an important symbolic treaty, it's really important to have a very wide participation. So, first of all, the court found in its advisory opinion, well, they looked at the preparatory work, the travaux preparatoire of the convention, and they said, uh, yes, the text of the convention doesn't allow for reservations, but uh, studying what the drafters thought, they didn't intend 
to prohibit reservations to the convention altogether. Uh, so they first of all decided that, and secondly, they said, uh, look, uh, even though the, there is a rule, a traditional unanimity rule, whereby no reservation is valid unless accepted by all the contracting parties, they said, in this case, given that we have a moral and humanitarian uh, treaty, the, these principles against genocide are at the heart of the treaty, um, this is important uh, to encourage participants, but there are limits on our encouragement. So they said the limit, and some of you will be familiar with this, this is now enshrined in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, uh, the test for when a, a reservation is acceptable is to look at the convention's object and purpose. And um, if a reservation ended by a state is consistent, nevertheless, with the object and purpose of the treaty, uh, it will be uh, acceptable. So that was the court's view. I must say that that has been criticized uh, uh, by many scholars since. Uh, and also that position has been developed in various regional human rights courts. But that was the view at least put forward in 1951. And that was quite an important one uh, in itself. So that's the Genocide Convention. Let me go now to another, uh, actually a series of cases that are important in this story about the procedural law of human rights at, at the court. So Southwest Africa, uh, which is modern day Namibia, has been the subject of a series of decisions by the International Court of Justice. So the League of Nations granted South Africa administrative power over Southwest Africa on the west coast of Southern Africa, which was a German colony uh, after the First World War. And they did that through the grant of a mandate under the mandate system of the League of Nations. So the mandate that was granted isn't a human rights treaty, certainly not in the way that we understand that term today. But it is striking that one of the things uh, that the mandate included was this clause, which is Article 2 of the mandate. And I've put on the right an image of uh, the Mandates Commission, the League of Nations Mandates Commission. But this Article 2 was quite important. And you can see it's not a full human rights treaty, but it says the mandatory power, in this case, South Africa, shall promote to the utmost the material and moral well-being and the social progress of the inhabitants of the territory that's subject to the present mandate. So, uh, of course, around the time that this case was brought, which was 1960, so a decade after the Genocide Convention, Ethiopia and Liberia, uh, who were both former members of the League of Nations, each brought proceedings uh, against South Africa, arguing that South Africa's um, exercise of the mandate in Southwest Africa breached its obligations under Article 2, because South Africa extended the policy of apartheid to Southwest Africa. So uh, the, the argument put by Ethiopia and Liberia was, look, uh, given that South Africa is manifestly not delivering on the promise of Article 2, the United Nations must supervise South Africa's performance of the mandate. Well, the first step, which is very common uh, in many cases before the court, is the respondent, South Africa, to uh, challenge the court's jurisdiction. And uh, it, it made uh, a series of preliminary objections. So I have here, uh, with the help of our wonderful uh, registry, I found uh, an image of the court. Uh, you can see with an old desk there, this is actually uh, South Africa, South Africa's council arguing the preliminary objections phase before the court. So uh, South Africa put these four preliminary objections, but the court rejected all of them in a decision that it rendered in December 1962. So one of the uh, one of the challenges that South Africa made, fairly understandably, was well, has the mandate for South Africa, which was dated 1920, has that survived the demise of the League of Nations, which of course was replaced by the United Nations? Um, and so does that document have standing anymore? So uh, the court uh, 
didn't rely on the text of the mandate itself, which wasn't very helpful, but it relied on the context in which the mandate was adopted to say, okay, the obligations under the mandate certainly survive the uh, dissolution of the League. So uh, another preliminary objection raised, well, the um, compromissory clause or what we might call a jurisdictional clause of the mandate that allowed disputes over its operation to be sent to the court said uh, the uh, power to institute judicial proceedings only applied to, quote, members of the League of Nations. So South Africa's argument was, well, there's no uh, state that's currently a member of the League of Nations because the League of Nations has, has, been, uh, has collapsed. But uh, so Ethiopia and Liberia don't have any standing. But the court said, look, um, that uh, interpretation uh, that was put forward uh, resulted in, and these are the court's words, in a meaning incompatible with the spirit, purpose and context of the dispute in which the words are contained. So in other words, um, states that were, had been members of the League of Nations could bring a case before the court. Um, and another uh, argument that had been put by South Africa as a preliminary objection was, well, look, only states whose material interests, those were the critical words, material interests were affected, could benefit from the right to take a case to the court, could benefit from the compromissory or jurisdictional clause of the mandate. Um, but <clears throat> the court dismissed that also and said, uh, really, um, the compromissory clause means it can be understood to give members of the League of Nations uh, a legal right or interest in the observance of the mandate by the uh, mandated territory. So the court dismisses all four objections and then it goes forward to argument the following year uh, well, in, in um, uh, and so here is a photograph of the court uh, this is during the merits phase when uh, the court should have been getting to the question, um, has South Africa violated the terms of Article 2 of the mandate? And perhaps you can see that the president there, the person who's reading, I'll just put my cursor there to draw to your attention, Australians might be interested. This is the first Australian to have been elected to the court and the first Australian president, the only Australian president indeed, uh, Sir Percy Spender, a former Australian uh, politician, and he becomes quite important in this case. So um, what was very shocking about the decision, which I think Percy Spender is reading out there in 1966, was uh, the court decided after its preliminary objections decision that the applicants, Ethiopia and Liberia, lacked a legal right or interest regarding the subject matter of their claim. So there are many critics of the court's 1966 judgment. And a recent wonderful one uh, critique is included in Professor Tony Yangi from Singapore, of course, his masterful, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, editorial in the European Journal on International Law on the Third World Approaches to International Law case, his, his brilliant, lengthy um, introduction there, which I utterly recommend to every student of international law and every practitioner of international law. But Tony in that deals with some of the fallout from a third world perspective of this case, because it became, I think it's fair to say notorious, not only for the weakness of the court's reasoning, but also what seemed to be a backflip, a backflip from the 1962 decision on provisional measures. And uh, there are uh, still uh, debates about it today. And here is a close up of uh, Judge Spender uh, reading. You can see the Vice President uh, Wellington Koo there. Um, there was huge um, controversy about this case. And I found this recent uh, that, well, this, this, this is a contemporary publication which. Um, discusses the, uh, the fallout from the case, really manifesting uh, the controversy. And of course, the, the court was actually evenly split on the decision, and then it fell to the casting vote of the president, Percy Spender, who voted against Ethiopia and Liberia standing 
and then the case um, didn't, didn't go any further. So it's often said, uh, many commentators say, look, uh, this was such a terrible decision jurisprudentially, but also politically, because this meant that many African countries, understandably, and indeed third world countries, who were just beginning to join the United Nations at that stage, really lost faith in the court as a potential forum for their interests. And it's often said that then a case just four years later, the Barcelona traction case, uh, which will be familiar to students of international law, uh, there was a, I apologize, there was a, a, an attempt to, as it were, rehabilitate the court. So the Barcelona traction case, anybody who's read it will know it's a highly unlikely human rights case because it concerned the diplomatic protection of corporate shareholders. But in this uh, judgment, the court uh, recognized the distinct nature of human rights obligations, almost as an aside, it, it, it's, it's, its references are very curious in the decision. And, but it held, which is a very important point, that basic human rights obligations, including protection from genocide and from racial discrimination are owed ergo omnes. In other words, um, they're owed against everybody it's 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 a it's a general obligation and you can see the image is one of a slide here so as opposed to reciprocal obligations bilateral obligations ergo omnes obligations are the concern of all states and all states the court said can be held to have a legal interest in their protection and uh so this was thought to be you know four years late but an attempt to at least mitigate the repercussions of the Southwest Africa judgment. Um, so I'm then going to, this is also, let me show you, this is an um, image of the court uh, argument during the uh, Barcelona traction case, which was a case actually brought between uh, Belgium and Spain. So I'm now going to leap ahead uh, in my uh, very whistle-stop tour of the court's jurisprudence, but uh, the court did uh, in the next three decades, of course, deal with human rights questions. Um, in a number of cases, the court had to deal with the right to self-determination and uh, one interesting case brought by Portugal against Australia, the over East Timor, uh, the court referred to, it endorsed, for example, a human right squarely, the right of self-determination of people. So there is certainly, it's not that the court is ignoring human rights um, at all in this case, but uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not developing the panoply of human rights. I want to very briefly then move to another case, uh, a case between the Democratic Republic of Congo and against Uganda that was decided in 2006. And uh, this was really, for our purposes, this case was important because it uh, dealt with uh, Rwanda, well, I should say Congo in relation to uh, uh, armed conflict between the two countries. Uh, the DRC uh, wanted to bring a case before the court based on the compromissory clause or the jurisdictional clause in a range of human rights uh, and other treaties. But Rwanda, the respondent, had entered reservations to some of those treaties. And the DRC, one of its arguments was, look, uh, Rwanda has invalidly entered reservations uh, to those treaties. But um, the court in, so this is 2006, uh, held, which was really a, a confirmation of the Genocide Convention advisory opinion, that uh, the uh, Rwanda's reservations weren't incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty. Uh, so it, the, one could read the, uh, and here's, here's the court argument during that case, now in colour, uh, the, uh, the court declined to extend its jurisdictional reach over matters of human rights concern. But this is a very interesting case because five judges of the court 
uh, including uh, Judge Higgins, Judge, Judge Koymans of the Netherlands, made a very interesting separate opinions where they uh, they really stated their uh, their reservations about reservations. They said uh, they think that it's and they use the words a very grave matter that through using reservations, states could um, effectively protect themselves from international judicial scrutiny, even when claims involve charges as serious as genocide. Let me race through to the next case, which is a case uh, involving this person, uh, Hussein Habri, who was uh, the president of Chad. So this was a case, uh, it's known as Belgium versus Senegal, uh, or the formal name is the obligation to prosecute or extradite. This was a case decided in 2012. Uh, and uh, this is a case perhaps where the court really develops its position on procedural human rights law in a very interesting way. So this was a case where Belgium insisted that Senegal fulfill its obligations under the, this time the Convention Against Torture to prosecute, it said Senegal must either prosecute Hussein Habre or extradite him to Belgium for alleged acts of torture during his period as president of Chad. Now, um, both Senegal and Belgium were parties to the Convention Against Torture and that treaty has a compromissory clause, a jurisdictional clause that says disputes about the meaning of this treaty can go to the International Court of Justice. But the question at the heart of this case was, um, okay, Senegal has consented through adhering to the compulsory clause to some claims being brought against it, but by who, by any country at all in the world, can Belgium uh, claim that? Does Belgium really have the standing in this case to insist that Senegal fulfill its obligations under the torture convention? Now, it might be thought, well, if, at stake were Belgian nationals. If the acts of torture had been, the alleged acts of torture had been committed against Belgian nationals, yes, that would seem to uh, be fairly clear that um, Belgium had an interest in bringing this case. But uh, in this case, the alleged victims, they did have Belgian nationality, but they had only acquired it after the alleged acts of torture. So did Belgium have enough of a special interest. And what's um, striking in this case um, is the uh, uh, fact that Belgium decided to, uh, the law perhaps was really stacked a bit against it, but it drew heavily on the work of the International Law Commission, that august body of jurists, which of course, uh, Nalufo Ral and Patricia uh, Galo Teles are members, this very important body, and it looked at the articles on the responsibility of states uh, that had been devised by the International Law Commission and said, uh, look court, uh, here is some interesting development of the law by this very eminent body of jurists, uh, and uh, these articles on the responsibility of states, if uh, they reflect customary international law, uh, they would allow Belgium uh, to insist on uh, the performance of Senegal's obligations under the Convention Against Torture and give Belgium a right uh, to um, insist on that. So uh, the court seemed to follow that. They dismissed Senegal's argument that uh, Belgium had to have a, quote, special interest, which had been the language pretty well of the court back in 1966 in Southwest Africa. So the court affirmed Belgium's standing uh, really by looking at the object and purpose of the convention and said, look, all states parties to this convention have a common interest in complying with the obligations. So uh, it, it, uh, it affirmed uh, the right of Belgium to do it. And now coming uh, to close to the end of the journey, precisely that argument. So you can see there've been a sm small inching forward uh, developments in procedural human rights law. And then we come to the very interesting case. And here is um, some of the oral argument, the case of 
the Gambia against Myanmar. This image, I should say, was taken during an early phase of the case when the Gambia sought initially provisional measures against Myanmar. This was in 2019. And you can actually see that the Myanmar legal team was headed by Aung San Suu Kyi, who of course now isn't uh, head of the um, government of Myanmar. So these photos are rather moving. And then the next image of the same proceedings is when Aung San Suu Kyi herself is presenting um, Myanmar's arguments in relation to provisional measures, but I won't deal with the provisional measures face. Uh, so in this case, so this is uh, the Gambia, which of course is in West Africa, saying to Myanmar, uh, uh, there is a dispute about whether or not the treatment of the Rohingya population in Myanmar uh, violates the Genocide Convention. And we, the Gambia, are going to take this case uh, this, uh, to the court for it to decide. Well, um, in this case, uh, the Gambia certainly wasn't making the argument that uh, it had suffered a distinctive wrong compared with all the other parties to the Genocide Convention. It simply said, uh, and there were no uh, citizens of the Gambia involved at all in it, but the Gambia just said, relying on the Belgium versus Senegal case, look, we have a right as a party to the Genocide Convention to claim performance by Myanmar of its obligations. And uh, in turn, Myanmar has a responsibility uh, for its failure to perform those obligations in relation to the Rohingya people. So the court in this case, it was dealing with, this is again, just to remind you, this is the compromissory clause, a jurisdictional clause in the Genocide Convention. And um, the uh, in the preliminary measures, uh, I beg your pardon, the uh, preliminary objections phase, uh, Myanmar understandably again said, look, the court doesn't properly have jurisdiction here um, because uh, really what is the Gambia's interest here? So uh, the court's judgment dismissing all of uh, Myanmar's, again, four preliminary objections was rendered just last year. This was the very first case actually that I'd sat on um, at the court, and it was a fascinating one to be involved with. So it was Myanmar's objections to the court going on to the merits. But, and you can read, of course, that's on the court's website, you can read the court's um, judgment in preliminary, uh, on preliminary objections. But uh, the court really um, completely, uh, it, it, it didn't, it didn't focus at all on the idea that the Gambia needed to have a special interest or a legal interest. Um, really, uh, the, quest, the main question that the court dealt with was the entitlement uh, of one state party, any state party to a human rights treaty to invoke the alleged responsibility of another under this um, compromissory clause. And the court said pretty clearly, the legal relationship between all parties to a human rights treaty flows directly from the convention's object and purpose. Um, and uh, that, that gave all states parties what the court called a common interest in the accomplishment of the high purposes of the Genocide Convention. And uh, it's, uh, the court really has um, affirmed that every state party to the Genocide Convention, of which there are many, has an interest in compliance in other states complying with uh, the uh, duties under the convention. So uh, the court actually said uh, this entails that any state party without distinction is entitled to invoke the responsibility of another state party for an alleged breach of its obligations, ergo omnes parties. So uh, you can read, I think, in an interesting way, the court's decision on preliminary objections last year in the Gambia case, almost as though the court is in dialogue with the 1966 case in the Southwest Africa case. And um, the, uh, if, if, if you look at that, you can see uh, the court uh, really, while in Southwest Africa, the court refused to adopt a broad conception of legal standing. 
Uh, but in the Gambia versus Myanmar last year, uh, the court finds no difficulty at all. It just says, um, given that the obligations in the Genocide Convention are owed to all of the parties in principle, this uh, is enough to affirm that any party is entitled to evoke another state party's responsibility. So uh, this was a very um, important decision. And of course, a very recent case of ours, um, bringing it up to date, is um, a case brought by Canada and the Netherlands against Syria under a compromissory clause uh, in the Convention Against Torture. And uh, really, you can see that the applicants in that case, Canada and the Netherlands, follow in both Belgium and the Gambia's footsteps um, in bringing that case against Syria. They certainly don't claim to have any special interest in Syria's performance of its obligations under the treaty, but they just say we are states parties to this, to the torture convention, and we have a right to seek compliance uh, with the convention. The court hasn't decided definitively whether it can hear the case yet, uh, but it has uh, granted just two weeks ago uh, provisional measures in, in that case. So then uh, to conclude, um, I think overall we can see that the court has been quite cautious in developing uh, the substance of uh, a human rights jurisprudence, but it has been, I think, uh, very progressive uh, in the way it's uh, moved, albeit very slowly over uh, 70 years, but it's, uh, it nevertheless has developed this, I think, very interesting human rights uh, procedural law. So uh, I think uh, given that all the limits on the court that I've mentioned, the fact that it's an interstate dispute resolution body where the interests of individuals are less prominent uh, compared certainly, say, to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights or the European Court on Human Rights. Um, it still shows, I think, my, my brief uh, whistle-stop tour here, that um, there is a lot of uh, power in institutional and scholarly dialogue in shaping jurisprudential developments. I think what's very important uh, is the fact that the reasoning in the Belgium versus Senegal case and the Gambia versus Myanmar um, I think the fact that both of those uh, judgments, if you read them, do are clearly influenced by the work of the International Law Commission and by academics such as my much esteemed predecessor here in the court, uh, Judge James Crawford, um, his work on state responsibility. Uh, this is a very important form of influence on, on the court. And as we uh, build up to next week, uh, International Human Rights Day, I think uh, the court where I am today is giving uh, some signs of hope of progressive development in this field. So that's the end of um, my PowerPoint and uh, my lecture. And But if, if there is time, and I'm just in the organizers' hands, if there is time to deal with any questions, I'd be delighted to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Judge uh, Hillary for, uh, Charlesworth, for this uh, wonderful, um, well, historical tour also of the work of the court. Um, I, I think it's very good for our participants to see actual pictures uh, from some of uh, the important negotiations uh, from the Genocide Convention and um, and also from um, historical cases uh, uh, that the ICJ has dealt with. So um, without wanting to um, uh, prolong this further, let me just open the floor uh, for questions. We have time for a couple of questions um, from our participants. Please um, raise your hand if you want to ask a live question or um, type it in the chat or the Q&A um, uh, boxes. I'm trying to monitor that. Um, let me see. Um, of course, uh, as you mentioned, Judge Charlesworth, uh, um, the three pending advisory opinions uh, are very focused on uh, human rights issues, not only human rights issues, but of course, uh, they're, they'll be featuring quite prominently. 
um, and, and that'll be very interesting as a follow-up uh, to your lecture to see if we, we do this lecture in uh, maybe two years uh, time, um, what would be the um, next slides that you would present um, uh, as, as a follow-up and with your hint of uh, the court being more progressive uh, in recent cases. But uh, I think we'll have to save that uh, for uh, next time. Let me just uh, check again. Let me check um, if we do have. We do have I don't... two hands. OK, great, wonderful. So uh, please, Akalanka, and then Natasha. Akalanka, please. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much. And I must say that uh, today was like a dream come true uh, to listen to this lecture. And ever since I got the glimpse of your book, The Plusit State, that you wrote uh, in 2005, uh, your ladyship, I think uh, I was quite uh, intrigued uh, to have maybe just to have written you an email, but I unfortunately could not do it. But so uh, to my question, uh, with what you have uh, discussed today and uh, with uh, the book that I read from you, I'm just asking, uh, you think, uh, is there a significant role that the judiciary can play when it comes to the incorporation of these rights into the domestic level? Because now as a country, Sri Lanka has ratified so many international human rights treaties, but we find that their implementation locally has not really happened. So in that context, like, uh, do you think that the international law may in future develop certain rules and maybe even uh, some state practices that may lead to uh, have more uh, of an enforcing mechanism within the domestic sphere because uh, that's something that uh, we experience here is that quite lacking because at the international arena we can see that there are many new developments but there is a bottleneck when it is being implemented at the domestic level. And in that sense, do you think that the judiciary can play a significant role? Yes, look, thank you. Me. Thank you. Will I yes. answer now, Patricia? Or, I was or... going to collect the second question. I think maybe it's, okay. uh, make, uh, it will be easier. So we, we get the question from Natasha, please, yes. Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to ask the question. Firstly, thank you for the background you have given us. So looking at the role of human rights and also the role of international organizations, right? Currently, we are having a war between Israel and Palestine. What is the role of, what is hindering international human rights organization in ensuring that there is peace? Or should we say in ensuring that the human rights of the people, for example, in Palestine are recognized? Or what is the progress which have been taken thus far, considering that we are having loss of lives, people, there is displacement and all these things which are happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please judge Charlesworth. Yes, well, thank you for both of those questions, uh, which I think in many ways are, are related. First of all, Atlanta, on, on the role of the local judiciary, um, I would say it's absolutely critical because as you say, it's all very well to have uh, wonderful human rights standards at the international level, but uh, their value is almost not completely entirely, but almost entirely at the national level. And unless uh, local legislatures and judiciaries are willing to take them into account, this severely uh, undermines, I think, their value. I, I, I can't speak about Sri Lanka, but I can speak about Australia. And I would say that uh, we have been, as, as a country, very slow. Uh, our judiciary particularly are quite reluctant to turn to international human rights law as a source of norms, uh, even when that's introduced we in, in our high court in Australia which is our top court it has a a um, really I think it relates perhaps even to our forms of legal education um, in many Australian law schools international law is an optional subject and it's done uh, often uh, it's not seen as critical 
to a law degree, whereas, of course, as an international lawyer, I think it should be compulsory, but that's not the case in, in many places. And I think there's, at least in the Australian judiciary, there's not a good understanding of the basis of international human rights law and a real reluctance to invoke those principles. So, yes, I think uh, this is a very important, uh, a very important uh, frontier to persuade local judiciaries that these are valuable uh, sources of norms. Uh, on the question of uh, the current uh, terrible, tragic situation in Israel and Gaza, um, what's hindering uh, recognition of uh, human rights there? Of course, I have no special expertise or knowledge. I only know what I read in the newspapers. But I, perhaps I can extend what I said in relation to the first question, to Akalanka's question, to answer this too. Um, I think sometimes when I hear commentators on the news talk, I, I would like to enrol them all in a course on international human rights law, because I think a lot of the commentary from all sides uh, seems to assume that this situation is operating in a vacuum. So there were no norms. It was just up to each country to work out what it thought uh, it needed to do in its own self-interest. Whereas international lawyers are aware, and international human rights lawyers, that um, uh, taking the commitments of international human rights law seriously means putting them into action. It doesn't mean just signing one day and then forgetting about them. It means actually translating them to everything that's done, particularly in times of conflict. So uh, I have no ready answer for this devastating situation, but as an international lawyer, I would wish, of course, that uh, these concerns were much, much more to the fore. And that's where international civil society, I think, can be very important. We all need to put pressure on our own governments uh, to take international law and international human rights law more seriously when they deal with these major, uh, these major international uh, disasters. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's two additional questions in the chat. One of them, I think I, we're going to save it for uh, tomorrow and next week's lecture because it's uh, a question on the relationship between international human rights law and international humanitarian law, which is also quite relevant to what was just said. Um, but I think it's a very broad question. And, and actually, this week we have human rights and next week in the academy, it will be international humanitarian law. So we'll have time to cover that. But maybe just one, there's one short question, which is short in terms of the length, but not in terms of the, the, the difficulty of the question, which is about the genocide convention and reservations and about uh, how genocide is use Kogan's norms and so whether in that regard um, uh, reservations should be permitted. Um, uh, so I think it relates to what you've been saying. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on this one, this would be the last question. Yeah, let me comment very briefly. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very good question. Um, and of course, I, I think the court in the, the advisory opinion on the genocide convention, which is well worth reading, uh, it, it says, well, uh, there are some clauses, obviously the prohibition on um, uh, oh, actions that must be taken if there is genocide, reservations cannot be made to those. But I guess the critical question is our so-called procedural parts of the convention, like Article 9, which I showed you, the clause that says disputes between parties about the meaning of this convention can go to the ICJ. Can you have res reservations to that more procedural clause? So uh, the court, as I say, decided, yes, uh, there could be valid reservations made to that. Uh, and uh, so, but I think it's very clear that uh, any reservation to a provision of the convention that went to its object and purpose or its heart and soul, if you like, uh, would, not, would not be acceptable. Uh, I do note, I can, may I just finish by noting that some states that made reservations to Article 9 when they signed the treaty, such as the Soviet Union, Ukraine and 
by Lorusia, then in, I think it was 1989 or 1990, withdrew those reservations. So what's interesting is that today, at least, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus have no reservations to Article 9 uh, as it currently stands. And that's the reason why the case that Ukraine has brought against uh, Russia based on the Genocide Convention, which relates to its so-called special military operation of last year, has um, that's the basis on which Ukraine has uh, brought it to the court. Wonderful, thank you. So much once again, uh, uh, Judge Charles Worth, for this wonderful, wonderful lecture. I'm sure that our participants have a lot of food for thought and um, uh, they will continue monitoring the case law of the court, uh, perhaps now with a different perspective, also looking normally, traditionally, we think about the ICJ on the limitation cases and uh, uh, questions related to um, um, sovereignty matters, immunities, or um, uh, use of force, but I think this uh, human rights dimension is quite important and you've highlighted it so um, uh, beautifully um, and, and, and the relevance of uh, uh, this, uh, I think, evolution um, in the case law uh, of, of the court. And so we're certainly uh, looking forward to the next um, um, uh, steps of the court. And, uh, and again, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, nice comments in the chat, and we appreciate also the um, uh, flexibility of our participants for this uh, last-minute switch. And, and and of course, the, dear Hillary, your um, your availability in in the moment, as as you said, and we all know, uh, at the moment where the court's been busier uh, than ever. So we really appreciate uh, you taking the time off um, uh, to speak to our participants, and it's a unique opportunity for them. Thank you so much. And we can, I think, give you uh, a virtual round of applause, which is what we can do in, in this kind of events. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And also for accommodating the muddle. Thank you very much.